Deb Katmeyer, film director, writer. Thank you for joining us here on WKCR. Thank you for having me. Hound Dog is being released September 19th. And uh, let's just uh, start. I mean, a, a lot of our listeners will already be familiar with the, uh, the story and the synopsis. But can you just uh, give us a, a brief summation, an elevator pitch, if you will? Of the story or of what I think it's about? Hmm. I mean, you're wanting the plot or you want my themes? <laughs> wow, well, uh, it seems that there's a difference, so that's interesting. Well, no, I would say, um, you know, the story is about this girl growing up in the South. She's mm-hmm. this free spirit romping through the wilderness in, in you know, Alabama in the late 1950s. And... Um, She's in a, um, you know, an environment that could crush her spirit, uh, but she's, she has music. She has Elvis, specifically. Um, it's the place she goes to express all of her pain, all of her rage, also her love and her joy, but it's her safe haven. It's the place she can express herself. And, um, you know, through this journey, there are a lot of twist and, twists and turns and bumps, and um, at a certain point along the way, her voice is silenced um, and then she is able to um, find her voice again reconnect to it on a much deeper level and really find her true voice uh, not Elvis's voice but her own and and with a uh, connection to her true voice she's able to turn and walk away from this world that um, can harm her into a new life for herself so that's the plot mm-hmm. and you know what the film is about, it's about a lot of things for me. It's about um, consciousness and bringing what's in darkness into light. It's about motherlessness. It's about female sexuality. It's about art. It's about healing. It's about finding one's true voice. Um, But I think the thing that it's most about for me is spoken by the character Charles who says it's about taking what can poison you and turning it into something powerful and good, which is what we as artists, if we're lucky, sometimes have the opportunity to do. And it's what Llewellyn does in the film, um, in the story. It's what she's able to do. Do you, do you want to talk uh, a little bit more in detail about, about that and, and how those events come about and how she takes darkness, or would that be giving something away? Well, I think, you know, uh, this specific event we're talking about is the rape that occurs in, in the film and and how her voice is silenced at that point in the film and how um, this caretaker, Charles, is able to really see um, see her spirit, see her struggle, see that she's on this path of self-destruction now, of uh, getting caught up in the cycle of abuse and is able to reach in and, and grab her out of that and, and pushes her to sing again and... Um, you know, reclaim her voice and her power and her spirit. Um. Now, um, of course, uh, most of our audiences will, will be familiar with this film as the film where Dakota Fanning gets raped. Mm-hmm. Um, you've had to deal with all sorts of wild flack. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened after this movie premiered at Sundance and some of the responses that have come about? Yeah, well, you know, the controversy started really before uh, Sundance. It started um, the last day of shooting, unfortunately, when mm. a disgruntled finder of funds uh, leaked to the press that um, he wanted to get his name in print as a producer and get his fee and had threatened my producers if that didn't happen immediately, he was going to the press. And instead of, you know... Um, say, no, don't worry, we'll take care of you. They sort of said F you to him, and he went to the press and um, leaked this story. And I think the only way to get a story in the paper at that time was to really sensationalize it. And he said that there was a graphic rape scene, which there's not. And he said that Dakota Fanning was um, nude throughout the film, which she's not. And this just started this snowball effect that just turned into this media frenzy. And, you know, it was really... um, it was intense. It was, um, you know, we had death threats. You know, there were petitions to have me arrested for child pornography and her mother arrested. And, um, you know, we had bodyguards at Sundance. It was insane. It was really crazy. Um, you know, at a certain point, 
uh, I decided, let me take this film down and show it to the district attorney in Wilmington, where, you know, if anything was going to happen in terms of prosecuting, that's where it would come from. I called and said, could we bring it down? And they said, absolutely. And they did a full in investigation of the film they ended up doing. Um, they, you know, interviewed cast and crew. They watched the film. And um, they ended up in writing, you know, saying they would not be prosecuting the film, that there was nothing inappropriate or indecent or illegal about the film or the making of the film. Um, and they, in fact, thanked me for making the film um, and thanked me for showing it to them because they said they prosecute the real thing every single day. In fact, the week before, they had just convicted a man uh, for impregnating his 10-year-old daughter. And that was in the newspaper, and there was not one phone call about that. But they got 10 to 20 phone calls a day requesting my film be prosecuted. And I think that's really sort of a, you know, a, a very, it's, it's really, uh, I think, a clear example of the phenomena that was occurring around the film. And um, it was really challenging. And I think that, um, you know, I did not set out to make a controversial film when I made this film. I did not set out to make a social commentary when I made this film. I made this film from my heart and in the hopes that it touched other people's hearts. And it was interesting because I think the controversy before Sundance um, was damaging to the film. And I think that it also generated certain expectations were, which were not met. It's a very small film. It's not a controversial film. Um, I think that, you know, it was, it was hard when I heard the critic screening was booed, and um, but yet the audience really responded to the film. Not everyone, you know. Um, some people didn't like it, but people really loved it. I actually had a man come up and say he hadn't cried his whole life, and I made him cry. You know, I had another man on the bus in in uh, Salt Lake City come up to me and and say, you know, I. Uh, I heard about your film. He was from this small town in Alabama, and he said, uh, you know, he's in his 60s. He said, I heard about your film. I was really angry at you, and I didn't want to see it, and I'm so glad I saw it because um, you helped me face something I've, I've never been able to face in my life before. And so, you know, it was hard and challenging, but it was also very rewarding at Sundance, and I think that the feedback I got from people encouraged me as I came back to finish the film. Now, you know, you mentioned this gentleman had not actually seen the film, had already been commenting on it. If you go mm -hmm. on to uh, IMDb and if you read some uh. of the comments, there's whole forums of people just going back and forth, none of whom <laughs> have seen, seen the, the film, film. <laughs> for the most part. I mean, that's kind of really unique for, a, for a film, right? All these people are uh, discussing it and, and, and burning it, uh, and uh, they haven't even seen it. Like, how do you right. react to that? You know, I think, um, like I said, I didn't make this film to create controversy, but I think now that it's been created, um, I think it's it's really powerful the way that it can bring light to some issues that really need to be discussed. Clearly, people need to talk about this. There's this much conversation happening when people haven't even seen the film. They need to talk about this. This is an issue that is an epidemic in our society. And, um, you know, I think I have a lot of compassion for the people who are attacking the film because I really feel like, you know, a lot of people don't have a place to face, you know, the support to face their own wounds. And I think that instead of dealing, looking at their own pain, they're projecting a lot of anger and fear onto my film. And um, again, I think it speaks to the need for us to have a conversation in our society about this issue. And, you know, I think the fact that Dakota did this role, she's given voice to millions of women and children who have been silenced. And um, you start giving voice to that much silence, it's scary. You know, I think there's like this societal terror around this issue. And, um, you know, when it's like you feel like you're going to die when you're, you have a big secret to tell. And I feel like there's like this feeling like we're all going to die if we start talking about this. And in fact, when you start to speak about it, um, you know, there's an opening for for a space for healing to come in. And I think 
there is a phenomena occurring that's very interesting and I hope you know I'm a filmmaker that's how I articulate I hope some people who you know really can talk about the social issue can can you know articulate it more gracefully than I can you know the the movie was endorsed by rain mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, rape abuse incest national network mm -hmm. Like you said, uh, a, a lot of the people who are, you know, expressing their voice, if, if you will, um, maybe maybe have uh, uh, some other issues. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about what what you hope this film could really accomplish? You mentioned other other people. You know, you express yourself as a filmmaker. How how can you expect some audience members who maybe have some something to deal with to deal with it? I think it can tap into, if, if you haven't dealt with these issues, it can really tap into them when you see a film like this. And, you know, I we are trying to set up um, on our website, um, you know, links to support so that people can get support when they see it. You know, I think one of the things that's been particularly disturbing to me about the controversy is that what message are we sending our daughters and our sisters if... Dakota Fanning is being so shamed for telling this story, shamed for telling a fictional story. What message does that send to our daughters and our sisters who need to speak out and break the silence around their own stories? And that's particularly disturbing to me. I think that we need to really support um, young women and, interestingly, older women. People live with this secret their whole lives, you know. This is a story that's very silenced. You can see it from all this frenzy that's happening right now. This is, you know, every two minutes an American is sexually assaulted and 50% of those assaults are on minors. 80 to 90% of children who are sexually assaulted never speak of it. So you're, you're giving voice to not just girls but to women perhaps in their 60s or 70s or 80s, you know. You're giving voice, Dakota's giving voice to a lot of people who, who I think have been silenced for a long time. So I think it could be powerful. Hmm. Your, your, your first and, and only other movie, uh, Virgin, mm -hmm. uh, also dealt with the issue of child rape. Why is this uh, a topic that's so important to you? Well, um, in, in that story, it's teenage, and in this one, is child, but I think that, um, you know, it, it is an epidemic in our society. Um, I grew up in the South, and, you know, I feel that, you know, it's the film's been criticized as being, like, cliche and Southern Gothic, and I don't believe that. I think that there's, um, you know, Virgin was set in the South, but because of the low budget, it was $65,000. I ended up shooting it in my backyard, essentially. So, But it was a Southern story, too. And I think that there is something, um, there's a deep truth in the South that um, there's something mythic about the dysfunctions of our world. And there's something beautiful in our desire to wrestle them. And these are my wrestlings with the dysfunctions of the South that I grew up in. The, the the Christian right mm -hmm. has uh, such a such a huge influence on mm -hmm. on in the South, and uh, when a lot of the complaints for this film were from Catholic and Christian powers that be, did you ever, in your childhood in the South, um, experience any sort of repression, rep rep repression <laughs> or um, yeah. censorship? From from oh sure religious yeah. powers. I mean, I think that that um, there's a great deal of repression uh, around um, women's sexuality. I think that um, repression is what leads to most of the abuse. I mean, you see that if you look at the, you know, problems in the Catholic Church. You know, I think that you see that there are so many secrets and so much repression, and that leads to a perversion of something that's actually natural and beautiful. And I think that. You know, why is it that a girl like Llewellyn, who is in the blossoming of her body and her spirit and her sexuality is seen as asking for it, which is a comment I get a lot about the film, um, when she's actually just, um, you know, reveling in the aliveness of her being quite innocently 
and quite simply it, it's it's uh it's the repression of this spirit that is so um dangerous i think um i i think that we live in a paradigm that doesn't honor women's sexuality girls sexuality as the beautiful awesome thing that it is. It doesn't nourish it or support it. Instead, it exploits it, it commercializes it, it represses it, and it abuses it. And it's interesting because I'll talk about the repression of girls, women's sexuality, and then I'm confronted by people with, oh, well, what about girls gone wild? What about MTV? And what I have to say is, you know what? Those young women are not connected to their true sexuality. They are acting out an idea of their sexuality that I think comes from this, you know, desperate need to to grab for something that's been robbed from them. And um, I think when you cut a woman, a girl off from sexu her sexuality, you're actually cutting her off from a huge chunk of her soul. And I think that the repression from the church is doing that over and over again. And I think then sexuality starts to come out in distorted ways and perverted ways and abusive ways. And it's very unhealthy. Let's backtrack for a second. Let's let's uh, talk a little bit about it was re-edited and how is it different and why did you choose to take it apart and put it back together again? Well, actually, um, it's, it's its first release. I mm. mean, it went to Sundance, but this is its first release it's um i would say it wasn't re-edited i would say it's finished mm. I, before sundance we were so rushed to get it ready i mean actually before sundance i was editing underground there was a an internal battle on my camp between my investors and they were trying to take the film away from me and they thought they had and they didn't know i was editing in a basement and no one knew i was editing until i let everyone know we'd been accepted into sundance at which point i was able to bring all the different factions to the table and get everyone together so we could finish the film. I didn't have financing to finish the film and getting into Sundance actually allowed me to get the financing I needed to finish. Mm. Um, but then it was such a rush and um, you know it was really about getting the plot together so that we could show a film with a beginning, middle, and end. And I feel like the Sundance cut was really about action, whereas this cut is so much about reaction. I think this cut is so much more nuanced and um, and layered, and, you know, the, the um, emotional textures brought out. And I think that I got that because the film is 50% different, but that's 50% different because I went in to every single scene and change takes and change the performance and really had time after Sundance. I mean, going to Sundance got the money to finish and to continue working after Sundance so that I could go in and really flesh out the film and go in and choose the performances that best told the story and best focused the story and really gave time for the performers to tell the story because I think the performances are incredible and that's the main difference I did one piece of restructuring after Sundance which was you know I gave you my whole list of what the film is about for me and it's so many things and I wanted to really focus okay what is most important and I felt like the silencing of her voice was the important uh, thing to clarify and so I decided that after the rape I would have her not speak at all. So I removed all the scenes where she spoke after the rape, um, except one where she screams at her father. But other than that, she doesn't speak until Charles gets her and pushes her to sing again um, and connects her back to her voice. Then she speaks again. Um, so structurally, that's the big difference. But in terms of scenes, I took out a couple scenes. I added a scene. But other than that, it's the same story it's just within each scene i really got to go in and you know um use the performances to really focus the story hmm. llewellyn is silence as you mentioned she finds her voice again through music when you were a young girl growing up in the south how did you find your voice before you turned to filmmaking um i think filmmaking is where i found it hmm. yeah so you're only able to truly express yourself once you got started in, in making movies. Well, you know, I started off acting, and that mm -hmm. was great. That was a place where I really, 
you know, could finally express things. And, and I always felt like uh, very grateful for that. I was also a cellist. I also tried visual arts. You know, I had a lot of um, different interests and talents. And I think filmmaking was the place I could really combine them um, in a way that felt very enlivening for me. Hmm. Now, where, where was the film actually shot. The cinematography uh, is very, very beautiful. Can you tell me a little bit about where it was shot and who you worked with on the photography? Yeah, it was shot in Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. And I, well, it was a little tricky. I, I started with Ed Lockman and finished with Ed Lockman, and mm-hmm. he's been unbelievable in terms of his collaboration with me on this film. Um, He'd come down to shoot, but he let me know that, well, he he was working on uh, Tadeen's film, the Dylan film, and um, they had lost their financing so suddenly they weren't going forward and he was available to shoot my film but he said look if they get their money together which there's no way in the next couple weeks they're going to you know I'm gonna have to jump back up and and shoot that film so we got started and we had a great time collaborating we looked at a lot of photography and um, you know I really wanted we talked a lot about trying to um, I wanted both the real rawness and the poetry uh, at the same time, and we really talked about how far we could pull each, you know, uh, extreme and how far we could go with that. Um, we talked a lot about this idea of bringing what's in darkness into light and how we would do that visually. Um, and then two weeks into the shoot, he got the call, and he had to leave. And we brought in Jim Denault, who was amazing. Uh, he came in. He had a very. He has a similar style to Ed, and he he came in, he did an amazing job. Um, and then after four weeks of shooting, we got shut down by the union for a week because we were out of money. And um, I was hustling for that week to get the financing. Everyone was just uh, heartbroken because the, the work had been extraordinary. Um, so we got the last two weeks of money together. But in in the midst of that, Jim had another job to go to. So because we'd pushed a week, you know, he had to leave a week early, and we actually had um, our gaffer, uh, Stephen Thompson, came in and shot the last week. Hmm. So then, in post-production, Ed came back in to the DI and was able to really, um, in the DI, bring all three DPs, you know, who already were working, I mean, Jim is in the same vein, and then Stephen had been there lighting for both of them. So it was all in the same arena, but he was able to really um, use the DI to pull it all together. I think it looks gorgeous. Mm, definitely. It seems like this film was written for Dakota Fanning. She seems so perfect mm. for the role. Tell me about the casting process. Was she always, you know, your star? Was she always the one you thought of, or was it there was Well, some I wrote story this here? script before she was born. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I did, literally. Um, it's 12 years in the making, this film. Wow. Um, but at a certain point in time, you know, this had it's been a long journey. We, we, Robin's been, was on board for 10 years, wow. and we had finance, financing together four years in a row, and it would always fall through at the last minute. And then we shot my first film, and then we got back to this. And at a certain point, one of my producers said, what about Dakota? she just done War of the Worlds. I'm like, well, yeah, but <laughs> we're not going to get Dakota. Yeah. Uh, but we sent her the script with a letter from me attached, a letter from my heart. And uh, then I let it go because I really didn't even, I wasn't even hoping for it. And a couple months later, I got the call saying, Dakota wants to do the film. Can you fly out tomorrow to meet her? And I got on the plane and went out. And I walked in that room. And the minute I met her, I knew she was perfect. Um, the depth of her presence is extraordinary. And she loved this character as much as I loved her. And we connected right then and there uh, through the character. And it was amazing. We, um, it was like we took each other by the hand and we walked into this very difficult world together and we didn't let go of each other until we got to the other side. And it was an extraordinary process working with her. It was a creative process. It was uh, an exciting process. It was a very powerful experience, and um, we had a great time making it. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you know, of course, every, every filmmaker, uh, when you ask them, uh, who, who do you want to see this movie, will tell you everyone. Um, but, you know, if you, really, if you really had to narrow it down, who is it 
most important for you to see this movie? Women. I, I, I would love for everyone to see this film, as you said, but, you know, I'm not a political filmmaker, but in, in the process of trying to get this film made for 12 years, I have not been able, I, I've not been able to avoid the politics of being a woman filmmaker and getting women's stories told. Um, you know, 6% of all films are made by women. And when you think about film as the medium in which we as a society tell our stories, and 94% of those stories are being told by men, I think that's that reflects a deep and chronic and disturbing imbalance. I, I think, I truly believe, and this has come out of 12 years of trying to get this film made, that our stories as women need to be heard. And I think we as women long to see our stories told. I mean, I still want to see films made by men. Absolutely, I love them. They, they, you know, inspire me. They touch me. They, you know, not all of them, but, you know, the ones that do, do. But I also want there to be space for women's stories to be told. I think when I go to the theater and see a film that touches me deeply, I feel less alone in the world. And I think that um, I'd like women to feel less alone in the world when they see this film. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have left. But Hound Dog is the movie, and Deborah Kantmeyer is the filmmaker. So thanks for joining us here on KCR. Thank you.